All right, Bible Warfare, How to Defend Your Faith. This is uh, lesson number nine in the series. What other religions teach about salvation? What other religions teach about salvation? If you've noticed, most of our questions in the series had to do with church issues. Well, obviously, people want to know things about the church. You know, uh, who is the true church? Or why do we do what we do in the Church of Christ? Or, do we have to attend and where should we worship and how should, you know, those are the usual questions when we have this kind of class. And then there are also a lot of questions on salvation and I think that's normal because salvation is an important, uh, an important issue. Uh, remember the one we started, uh, we started with, you know, why do people in the Church of Christ think they're the only ones saved? You know, that, that gets asked all the time. Uh, is baptism necessary for salvation? We talked about that a couple of times uh, so far. Uh, can you be lost uh, once you're saved? So those are the general questions. Uh, probably the most asked questions in this type of class because these are the questions on the mind of people who attend church regularly. They think about these uh, things. So the questions about church are, uh, to, um, are the ones that are debated among those who call themselves Christians. You know, Christians will debate with each other. You know, how is it, you know, what's proper worship? Well, that two Christians are going to talk about that. Uh, who is the true church? The role of baptisms, uh, the role of women in the church. Again, the, the believers are going to be debating those type of things. Uh, you need to remember, of course, that the closer you are to what the Bible actually teaches on these subjects, the stronger your argument. You're always going kind to of be able to come back with what the Bible teaches. Um, I've, I think, repeated the idea that it's not about the size of the church or the, you know, the group. It's not about tradition or name recognition when it comes to these type of matters, these type of questions. It's always about Bible accuracy. You know, Christianity is based on the Bible. Uh, the example I give is uh, the Roman uh, Catholic Church, something I know about because I grew up as a Catholic in a place where most of the people were Roman Catholics. So you've got the Roman Catholic Church, which is huge, it's old, has name recognition all over the world, but none of these things enhances its weak doctrinal positions on subjects like baptism or, or, or other matters, the organization of the, of the church. Ideas and teachings that are settled by biblical accuracy, not how big your church is, you know, not how old your church is, not how you know, spectacular your worship service is. That, that counts for nothing when it comes to answering important Bible questions. The important thing is, what does the Bible teach? So I keep you know, reminding you of that idea. So when discussing differences with fellow believers, it's important that you stick with the Bible as your base and proof. Okay, so that's a bit of a review of what we've been talking about. Now the questions of salvation are discussed, are discussed also by believers but the real conflict comes when discussing salvation issues with people who are not Christians. I don't mean they haven't become Christians yet. I mean they're not Christians. They're of a completely other religions. So there are 12 major organized religions in the world, in the history of the world. Some people say, are you kidding? Only 12? I thought there were hundreds or thousands. Well, there are. But there are only really 12 main groups and all of the other religions are kind of you know, uh, you know, branches of, 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 of different uh, groups. And so 12 major organized religions in the history of mankind. However, each one of these has its own view of heaven and salvation. Because the idea of being saved, we, we say saved, but the idea of going to heaven or being with God, no matter how you explain that, is part of every religion. Every religious group has a particular teaching on how does somebody go to heaven or how, how does somebody live after death or whatever. And so it's difficult when discussing with someone of a completely other religion the idea of salvation. So in order to help you uh, kind of work your way through that. Uh, tonight I want to go over in a very brief way uh, the salvation concept 
in every one of the major religions in the world, all in 30 minutes. So we, we're going to be flying here. One thing I need to mention, um, when you're studying religions and you're comparing them, you know, they call it comparative religious studies, you're comparing one religion to another, the way that they list religions is by ge geography. So you have you know, Eastern religions, far Eastern religions, near Eastern, you know, it's always broken down by geography. Okay? So that's how we're going to uh, uh, do it tonight. And so we're going to begin with Near Eastern religions in this group. First group is Zoroastrianism, a very ancient religion nearly extinct. There are still some that practice Zoroastrianism in the world today. A religion that comes from Iran is also from India, Afghanistan. Their idea of salvation is the individual struggles against evil. And if that individual wins over evil, then they go into the place called heaven. That's their concept of salvation. A winning struggle against evil in one's life. Judaism, again, considered a Near Eastern religion. We know the source, Israel, of course, and there are Jews all over the world. In Judaism today, the nation itself is chosen by God, and as part of the nation, you're saved. The idea is that if, you, if, you're, if you're a Jew, and part, a faithful Jew and part of the nation, then you're subject to the reward. Now, different groups within Judaism have different ideas some don't believe that there's any afterlife. Some do believe that there is one. But the idea about salvation is always the same from group to group. You have to be part of the group in order to have salvation. Christianity, this is why I said it's grouped by geography. So Christianity is considered a Near Eastern religion because it started you know, in Israel. Of course, it's spread all over the world. Basically, the idea of salvation in Christianity is that salvation is a gift from God based on faith in Jesus Christ. That's as, that's as compressed as I can make it. I know some say, well, what about baptism? Or what about, well, sure. Yeah. How do you express that faith? Well, you express it in repentance and baptism and so on and so forth. But if you're going to just give a, a very brief, succinct, you know, a definition of salvation for Christianity, it's a gift from God accessed through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, next group. Eastern religions, three of those. The first is Islam from the Middle East, of course Africa and now all over the world. For Islam, salvation is accessed by practicing and repeating the five pillars. The five pillars of Islam are fasting, pilgrimage, giving alms, prayer, you know, prayer five times a day, mm -hmm. and confessing you know, that Moha, uh, Muhammad is the prophet. A continual practice of these things, a faithful practice of these things is what saves you. An interesting thing about Islam, there's never really a hundred percent sure thing. Because you, if, you, if you talk to a Muslim, you say, well, you can be saved, but if you're not, praise Allah anyways. <laughs> so in Islam, you can do all the right things and still maybe not make it because Allah thinks uh, you're deficient in some way or another that no one else is aware of, but, you're, but he's aware of. In the Islamic religion, the only 100% sure way to be in paradise is through death through jihad. That's the only 100% sure way to be in paradise, that you die while you know, fighting disbelievers. Uh, and the disbelievers are, are us. 
which may explain some of the allure. You, know, you wonder why are some young, perfectly healthy young men you know, blowing themselves up? What's, what's behind that? Well, you know, in a lot of the country, unemployment's 80%. Uh, in Islam, you, you have to have a dowry, you have to have money, you have to have something in order to have a wife. And if you don't, you don't get a wife. So with very dim prospects, of work, success, personal fulfillment, with very difficult prospects of having a wife or finding a wife if you're poor or you know, don't have a lot of education, dying in a blaze of glory with the absolute guarantee that you will be in paradise, that begins to you know, look pretty good, especially if the you know, the leaders who are you know, setting you up to blow yourself up uh, pay your family a certain amount of money. All right? So there's not just religious zeal behind you know, suicide bombers, there's also the economic idea and the social pressure on a lot of uh, young men and young women. But basically, salvation is accessed through the practice of the five pillars. Hinduism, of course, in India. Hinduism, the idea of salvation or the way to salvation is by eliminating evil in your life until you are pure enough to merge with Brahma. Uh, in Hinduism, God does not have an individual personality. It is a force. You know, in the Star Wars and these movies, the force be with you and people are saying, Wow, what a concept. Where did they get that from? Well, they got it from Hinduism. That's where they got it from. The force be with you. That's the whole idea behind the Eastern religion. A great force. And of course, you continue you know, to keep trying life after life after life to purify yourself before you finally, why do you think they not, they're not, you're not allowed to kill a cow? People are starving in places, but you can't, you can't kill a cow because many believe that the cow is the last um, reincarnation that you are transformed into before the next step of being taken up uh, you know, and merging with Brahma. So they don't want you know, to spoil somebody's chance of, even to this day, I read an article a little while back that there was a big you know, argument about this with the government and, and, and the government you know, came down on the side of their religious tradition and history. You still, you, know, you, can't, you can't destroy these animals for food. Another religion, Sikhism, also in India. Sikhism is a, an amalgamation of several of these Indian religions, so they, they have similar things. In Sikhisms are the individuals you know, that wear the little sword and the, uh, you know, the, um, the turban. And, uh, um, Sikhism, repeating God's name and the love of mankind will bring you this, to the same objective as Hindu religion. The big difference between uh, uh, Hinduism and Sikhism is more uh, social and political. In Hinduism, you have the, the caste system, you know, where you have the different you know, stations in life, and if you're born into that station, that's where you stay. You can't move your up or down. Sikhism was a push to maintain some of the same ideas of Hinduism without the caste system. There's no caste system in Sikhism. Okay? So those are the Eastern religions. Then you have the Far Eastern religions, there are four of those. One is Confucianism in China, Confucius, not really a religion, but it's considered a religion for study purposes. It's more a political or a so, it's a social system if you wish, but the belief is social conformity and virtuous living will give you heaven on earth. You wonder sometimes, you, know, you look at China and the, and the things that they do, you know, public things, and what do they have? You know, what, what do we have here in the West? Well, we have, fire, you know, we have uh, fireworks, and we got dancers over here, and we got uh, you know, singers over here, and we got people tumbling over there. You know, our shows, if you wish, are like that, you know, three ring circus. 
When China puts on a big public thing, what is it? 10,000 dancers doing the same moves, right? Why? Because they've been so influenced throughout the decades by Confucianism. Confucianism teaches that you will have heaven on earth, you know, by conformity. People just conform to the right way of living. Then we will create a society that works well heaven on earth. Still, even though China is you know, not a religious country, obviously, there's still this influence there. And it serves the communist government well. Why not to have everyone believe that the right thing to do is to conform to everything if you're the one in charge making all the rules? Ah, sure, go, go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Shinto, the religion of Japan, believes that the country itself you know, fell from the heavens and the emperor is a god and the people are children of the gods. In the Shinto religion, Japanese supremacy and maintaining it was heaven on earth. Same idea. They had this, uh, you know, I've mentioned this before, Second World War, you know, the suicide bombers, you know, they'd fly their planes into American ships and so on and so forth believed that when they were doing this, you know, they were doing it for God. They believed that because the emperor was a god, it was impossible for them to lose. Impossible. That's why they didn't give up. That's why when they lost battles everywhere, when the Americans were cutting off their island, you know, the embargo, we're talking the Second World War here, there was no way they could win. They were surrounded. They would not give up. Why? Because they thought their military was superior? Because they thought they had, like, they had a secret weapon? No, because they, since the, the, the rank and file, sincerely believed that they were on a mission from God and their emperor was God and they couldn't lose. But then you know, when, the, when America you know, dropped a couple of uh, nuclear bombs on, on a couple of their cities and they saw the devastation, it wasn't the people that gave up. It was the emperor that finally realized that if they continued, I mean, they would just be completely wiped out as a people. He'd have no people left. It's not good being a ruler when you don't have any people to rule. As a matter of fact, in the, uh, in the surrender, unconditional surrender, one of the terms in the, in the surrender was the Japanese had to take this idea out of their religious thinking. They were forced to take it out of their, you know, their, their uh, inst religious instruction. They even changed, they had to change their flag. Their flag was a circle, a red circle, and it had rays that went all around. And, and, and the meaning of the flag was that was Japan at the center of the world and its rays went everywhere. They, they were you know, manifest destiny to conquer the entire world. And the United States made that one of the conditions of the unconditional surrender that they had to change their flag. And what is their flag now? A white background with just a red sun in the middle. They took away the, you know, the rays. Shinto. Uh, Buddhism, idea of salvation in Buddhism comes from India also, Vietnam, China, Thailand. In Buddhism, the idea of salvation is the elimination of desire leads to eternal bliss. You have to understand in the Eastern religions, their end game, if you wish, the idea of heaven, okay, is an unconscious, uh, is becoming unconscious. You continue to exist, but you're unconscious. You, uh, the best description I've read is uh, you're like a drop of water that falls into the ocean. So you're still water, but you have merged with the great body of water, with with, with the, the force. And so in Buddhism, um, through uh, meditation, through religious practice, through asceticism, the, the goal is to um, discipline the body to the point where the body does not have a desire for anything. No food, no comfort, food, but to keep you alive, you know, but I'm saying you, know, you eliminate all desire 
And their idea is if you eliminate all desire, you eliminate all pain and suffering and you know, evil. Taoism, you know, the yin and the yang, you know, that's from Taoism, from China and also Japan. Taoism is another one of these religions that believes you know, heaven on earth type thing. And the way to achieve that is to have, um, to become balanced in your environment. You know, balanced in your environment. A good example, someone, I remember one of my professors says, if you want to know the difference between Taoism and you know, Americanism, he says in America, uh, you want to build a road from uh, point A to point B, well, to get out the bulldozers and the rock movers and everything, and you start at A and you, bull your, you bulldoze your way through the mountain and the trees and you get to road B and you, you build a road. You know? in, Ch in ancient China, you had to go from A to B. You started at A, you went around that tree, then you went around that mountain, and then you avoided that creek, and then you avoided this grove of trees, and you know, it was, why was it like that? Taoism, you don't disturb what is there. You're in harmony, you know, the yin and the yang. You're, you're, you're balanced. Balanced living. What is it, feng shui? Is that, uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Some, you, you understand, people go into your house and they move the furniture around? Feng shui. Yeah, so that you can, you know, that everything in your house is placed in the right position so that you're in balance with the light and the air coming into your house and the movement through your house so that you're in balance. That's Taoism. Okay. Now there are a couple of other non-organized religions. Again, for purpose of study, people break them down you know, in these categories. It makes it a little easier to discuss. One of them is paganism. Paganism is religion. It's worldwide, there are forms of paganism everywhere. You read the Bible, right? What are you reading about when the, when the Israelites uh, you know, enter the land of Canaan, all the pagan religions that were there? So all forms of voodoo or witchcraft or magic or nature worship. Nature worship is the type of religion practiced by uh, Native Americans here in the uh, United States and in other places where the, the subject of the worship or the participation of the land and the air and the tree, you know, the sacred burial grounds. Yeah. So the idea in paganism is that man manipulates the spirits or the unseen forces in order to create heaven for themselves here on earth. I've also mentioned that to you, magic and the occult. The idea of magic and the occult is you've got something physical that you manipulate or you say words or you, you, you make a brew or you do something in the physical world that will somehow manipulate the spirits in the spirit world to act in your favor or to act against someone else. You know, voodoo, you know voodoo, the doll, Perfect uh, example, a voodoo doll. You, know, you get, a, you get a, a representation of a person that you don't like or your enemy and you stick pins in it. You know? and, and that's the occult. And then atheism. Say, so, well, how can atheism be a religion? Well, it's a kind of a religion. In atheism, man or mankind is the highest form of life. And there is no heaven, there is no salvation. There's only here and now, the material world. And so heaven is what you make of it here on earth using whatever system or philosophy that works for you. That's pretty much what atheists believe. So these are the you know, major beliefs of the world and in history concerning salvation. And again, I have to repeat, we've, we've not done the topic justice. You, know, you, you could do 13 weeks on every single religion, but I'm just trying to give you, a, you know, just a, a, a kind of a bite-sized idea of what each of these think. Now please note some important points about these various beliefs when you compare them. First of all, they all have some form or idea of salvation. 
Every group aspires to a better life somehow, either a better life here through the practice of their quote religion or belief, or a better life in another world, the spirit world, after this life is over. But every single one of them has this idea in their religion, which is actually the thing that moves the religion. Take that element out, the religion is useless. And secondly, and this is the important one, every one of these except Christianity is a works or law based system for achieving salvation or heaven or the good life or whatever it is. All of them are work based concepts. For example, in Zoroastrianism, the person has to win the struggle over evil. Well, if that's not a works-based idea, I don't know what is. You got to win, you, you got to win. You have to find a way to overcome the evil if you want to get the reward. In Judaism, you must obey, you, you know, you're a Jew, but you must obey the Jewish law and customs. In Islam, Muslims must practice the five pillars successfully. They have to pray every day five times. They have to a pilgrimage to Mecca or support someone who is going to go on your behalf. You have to give the alms you know, and so on and so forth. You have to fast during Ramadan. So you, you, know, you, you have to do these things. And again, the sad thing is, and even if you do, if Allah decides you're not coming in, well, well, Praise Allah anyways, his wisdom is the, you know. In Hinduism, the individual must purify himself from evil, <laughs> never mind in one life, <laughs> life after life after life after life after life. You just keep you know, being reincarnated to do what? To purify your life so that you are worthy to merge with Brahma. In Sikhism, Proper worship and conduct must be performed in order to be, and the word is, worthy to be saved. In Confucianism, again, heaven on earth is possible, but only through personal conformity to the rules of society. Shintoism, you must maintain Japanese supremacy at all costs. Second World War. Uh, you know this, uh, how many times have we read stories about Japanese soldiers uh, in the jungles that they found you know, 35 years after the war was over but they were still holding the fort. Nobody told them that the war was over. In Taoism, no harmony. Harmony you know, in, your, in your personal existence, you know, that, that's as good as heaven gets for you, but still you don't get that without conformity to the rules or the laws of nature. Paganism, they have to appease the gods and they have to appease the spirits in order to be rewarded. And the most uh, you know, graphic example of this was uh, the, uh, the people who worshiped the god Molech. You know, we read about that in the Old Testament. Canaanites, what did they do? They offered their firstborn sons or firstborn child to the god Molech by burning them in fire. You know, how, much, you know, how much does Molech want from you? He wants your firstborn. I mean, literally, he wants your firstborn. And of course, atheism, compliance to a system or a philosophy, you know, you got to do that to be happy. Or total non-compliance in order to be free. So you're either going to be an anarchist, you know, break all the rules or keep all the rules, but you've got to deal with the rules. And so this is why I say every single one of these religions, the burden is on the human being to do something or achieve something or comply with someone or something in order to earn or find heaven, nirvana, salvation, 
happiness, moksha, Brahma, you name it, you, whatever it's called, the paradise, the Islam paradise. You got to do something in order to be worthy of it. Christianity is the only religion where the offer and the burden for accomplishing salvation rests solely with God. And man can do nothing on his own to deserve or to accomplish his salvation. Now I'm not saying we don't respond to God, but our response to God, and as I've mentioned many times in repentance and baptism, we're not doing that to earn our salvation, we're doing that to demonstrate our faith. Very important. This is why it makes me so sad when I see someone you know, leave Christianity to become a Muslim. I'm thinking, really? It's like putting yourself in jail. I remember in Montreal, these little girls on the metro, these little French Canadian girls you know, with their hijabs and they just thought, oh wow, I'm a Muslim woman now. I'm thinking, you poor girl, you just become a slave in this religion. <laughs> and if you're not married yet, you're going to find out what slavery is really like. We had a young woman in the church there who was dating a a fellow who's a Muslim and he was very nice to her and blah, blah, blah. And I, I tried to warn her. I said, this is, you know, this is what's going to happen. Oh no, he's not like that. Mm -hmm. And they went ahead and got married. Um, and uh, three years later with her baby, he wanted, to take, he wanted to take that child and go back to, I forget which country, Jordan or somewhere, without her and take the baby and not come back. And she had to, you know, she had to uh, conform as a Muslim woman to um, you know, the religion of, of Islam. And she didn't want to. Well, you know, we, we see many times you know, in a mixed religious marriage, you know, he's a Methodist and, uh, or he, you know, he's a member of the Church of Christ and she's a, a Catholic or something. They have to kind of have some communication there because of their differences. They, they both believe Jesus is the Son of God and so on and so forth, but you know, they, they need to work things out if they're going to make their, their marriage succeed. But that doesn't happen in a marriage between you know, someone who, quote, is a Christian and someone who's a, a man who's a Muslim, a practicing Muslim. Uh-uh, doesn't work that way. Salvation from a Christian perspective is possible and available to everyone. No if, ands, or buts. There's no, well, you're saved if God feels like it on that day. Uh -uh. It's not Christianity. It's not culturally or geographically based like a lot of these other religions. Judaism, I mean, the news that Mr. Or President Trump said today, we're going to, we recogn we've, we've recognized for decades that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Uh, but the American embassy was always located in Tel Aviv you know, to not make any trouble with the Arab countries around them. Well, today, Mr. Trump said, yeah, no more now. Uh, we believe that the capital of Israel is in Jerusalem and we're going to be moving the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, something that has been promised for you know, 50 years or so, but nobody delivered on. The reason I say that, it's not political, the reason I say that is that these religions are tied to the earth. If, if, if one of the other countries nuked Israel, I, I certainly wouldn't want that to happen, but let's just say, they dropped a couple of nuclear bombs on, everything was destroyed, totally destroyed, the temple, the mosque, everything gone, wiped off the face of the earth. How would that affect us as Christians? I'd be sad for the individuals who live there, certainly sad for the Christians who live there. It wouldn't change my religion in any way, but it would be a big change. It would be a big change for, for Jewish people. Their religion is tied to the earth. Islam, their religion is absolutely tied to the earth. Why do you think they're trying to overtake countries? Because you know, their religion, you know, when they have a piece of dirt, oh, oh, okay, there it is, we own that, that's part of our 
You know, that's part of our heritage. It demonstrates that our religion is successful because we're taking land, the caliphate, you know, Christianity. What does Jesus say? My kingdom is not of, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, if my kingdom were of this world, my angels would be here fighting for me. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. Our kingdom is not of this world. Christianity offers a tangible, conscious, personal experience of salvation and heaven with which others don't. We get a taste of heaven, the fruit of the Spirit living within us. The stronger that our, uh, that our faith grows, the stronger our hope is that we have the reward before us. We can actually feel encouraged. Unlike other religions, you got to keep, you know, coming back one life after another. Christianity promises life eternal after death. Confucianism, Shintoism, Taoism, atheism, no, there is no life. This is the only, the best heaven you're ever going to get is here. Christianity is a salvation offered because of love and received because of faith. Zoroastrianism, Islam, these are all works based. Christianity is filled with hope for the future. Paganism, especially, is based on fear, mystery. We're always doing something to push away the evil spirits. So when you, when you compare religions, you can see many practices and fascinating histories and great leaders and deep spiritual ideas but the bottom line is always what they teach about the salvation of the soul or what they teach about heaven or the improvement of the spiritual person. I mean, that's what religion is all about in the end, reconciling human beings with the one who is greater than they are. That's what religion is about. So in the debate over this issue among the 13 major religions or systems in the world, Christianity's teaching is universally accessible and timeless. And it is unique among the 13. In all the other religions, man has to reach up and pull himself up to God. Christianity is the only religion where God reaches down and brings man up to himself. I ask you, which religion do you want to practice? <laughs> if you had no religion and you were offered the two, which way do you want to go? You want to climb up to heaven or do you want God to reach down and, and, and take you and bring him up to himself? I think, I mean, my money's with God taking me up to heaven. It is the most desirable religion because it is unlimited. Eternal life with power, with happiness, with consciousness, with knowledge of God, with knowledge of self. You know, people say, well, I know who I am in heaven. Absolutely, how could you be happy if you didn't know who you were? If you all, all of a sudden you popped up and you're in heaven, but you didn't know who you were, you had no consciousness of who you were, how could you experience happiness? You have to know who you are. You have to be able to know, I'm in heaven. <laughs> Everything that I read in the scriptures was true. I knew it was true, but now I'm here. So you have to be conscious in order to, you know, to experience happiness in heaven. Will we know each other? Absolutely we'll know each other in heaven. Why wouldn't we? If I'm me and you're you, why wouldn't I know you? And people say, well, what do we talk about? You know what? I probably won't be interested in talking to you and you won't be interested in talking to me because I'll be way too busy talking to God. Way too involved in knowing Him, absorbing Him. Will we think about the people who didn't make it? I don't think so. In the parable, you know, the rich man and Lazarus, you know, where it says there's a, a gulf between the two. I don't believe that that is a literal thing. I believe that's a parable. But one of the things it teaches this parable, there's a gulf. That means there's something between us and heaven and those who are not there. 
You know, when Jesus says, you can't go there, they can't come here, we can't go there. I think what he, he doesn't mean physically, we can't go there. I mean, we can't go there up here. Because that would be sadness, right? I have a brother or I have a mother or I have a grandpa or whatever who was kind of a good guy but had no use for religion whatsoever, didn't believe in anything, no afterlife, you know, period. Well, according to the Bible, that individual is not going to be spending time with God in the spirit world. But I think, this is only my opinion here, but I think that this will not sadden us in heaven because we lose the fleshly body and the fleshly memories and the fleshly things that go with it. We have a spiritual. And I, and I personally believe we will be so absorbed in knowing God, you know, it'll, it'll wipe out everything else. No other religion offers this or has a historical documentation of God's appearances, miracle, words to confirm these promises? Mohammed never did any miracles. You know? So when it comes to a discussion of salvation with other religions, we have the most compelling and powerful argument for the salvation offered through faith in Jesus Christ. So when talking about religion with someone of another religion, the best place to make your case is the superiority of the teaching on salvation in the Bible for the Christian religion. You're not going to argue with a guy who's a Muslim about baptism. What does he care about baptism? Baptism, only, only a person who's interested in Jesus and pleasing Him wants to know about, okay, well, what's baptism? Sure, I'll explain that to you. But a Muslim doesn't care about baptism. A Hindu doesn't care about baptism. But he does care about salvation. He does care about what happens after life. A Hindu cares about that and a Muslim cares about that. And we have, the Bible teaches us a much superior experience of salvation. Okay, I had some more stuff here, but we'll stop here and I'll find a way to get it into the next lesson. All right, thank you for your attention. Appreciate it.